Good afternoon. Um, I told uh, Paul that it was okay to leave the blinds open, so if anybody's really distracted, um, you know, start paying attention this way, that's fine. Um, my name is Sean Anderson, and I am a principal solution architect for Pivotal, and uh, I'm also practice lead for application modernization. And so what that really means is my team and myself um, help large enterprises modernize their systems. Often they're, you know, four or five million lines of code. How do we, how do we get whatever they determine is a modernized system, usually to the cloud? Um, frequently they're mission critical applications, um, occasionally life depending applications. So we've, we've built up a lot of wisdom by making a lot of mistakes. Hopefully that didn't cause too much trouble. But what I wanted to do was go through and talk about the methodology that's evolved over the last couple of years that's called the uh, SWIFT method. And it's using DDD techniques to help customers modernize their enterprise systems. But as we've gone through this, we've realized that it's not just valid for modernizing um, existing applications. It's, it's valid for greenfield applications. Um, any, anything that you need to model and visualize from a uh, capability standpoint, uh, customers have really liked this approach. So what I'm going to do is, is start talking about definitions. We've heard a lot about uh, different definitions and how important ubiquitous language is in a lot of the other talks. And the first one that I always have trouble with is what is modernization? And Dilbert has a habit of being able to completely uh, nail it, right, with, with modernization. And in this particular case, um, really what modernization means is figuring out what the pain is and solving it, right? Uh, you know, to some people it might be, well, we're running on Java 6 and it's end of life and this is our critical application, how do we upgrade? But in more cases, it's we have, we have business forces, market forces that are forcing us to stay competitive and our architecture doesn't allow us to do that. And that's the more common approach. So in this case, you can just throw buzzwords at it, or you can, you can actually try to solve a problem. And I'm going to tell a story about the origin of the methodology that we're talking through today. And this problem that we have is I was assigned to go to a financial services company here in the States, and it was a, a very large corporation. And, and essentially what it, what my charter was, was, Sean, can you go to this company and, um, you know, do some discovery? You have, you have two weeks, and at the end of two weeks, they want to have a North Star guiding principle. They want to know what their new architecture is going to look like, how we're going to modernize this application because competitors are kicking their butts, right? They're not able to respond to these market forces quickly. Um, and incidentally, they're on a mainframe. So... This is millions of lines of COBOL. Um, there's a lot of problems here, um, not the least of which is the mainframe is expensive. They're leasing it, paying for the processing power. Um, the team itself has a scarcity of domain knowledge, so there's a lot of really smart people. They just hired 150 new Java developers who don't know the system, but they also don't know DDD. Um, and a lot of the developers are very unhappy because, you know, in this day and age, if you're a COBOL developer, you're limited resume-wise. You may be really in demand in certain situations, but in most situations, people want to work on the new hotness, right? So that developer happiness is part of part of the issue that we see. Um, also, as you can imagine, in a highly regulated company, um, it's very waterfall from a process perspective. So even if we can get software built quickly, there's a lot of gates and blockers and architecture review boards. Um, and of course, it is he heavily regulated. So, um, so the first thing I did uh, actually, the second thing I did, the first thing I did was crawl out from under the bus that my boss threw me under. The second thing was I thought, well, let's, let's just start thinking about, we have the short timeline, what are our assets and what are our liabilities? And, you know, start from there, at least we have something. 
so from the assets perspective, the, the company had, had a big commitment. So like big enough that people were putting their jobs on the line saying, we want these guys to come in and, and uh, help us with our system. And you know, it's quite a bet, right? When a, when a corporation is saying, we want to invest millions of dollars. Um, I really hope that this works, but we're committed to it. Um, the other asset that we had was uh, we had access to the mainframe and we had one or two experts who have worked on the system for years and we can use that to our advantage. And interestingly, the teams themselves were already organized around the, the business contacts, capabilities. And it doesn't matter if they were organized correctly or the way that we would define it, but they were organized well enough that at least the people organization problem is something we don't have to deal with as much. Um, another asset they had was office supplies. And I like arts and crafts, and we'll talk more about that. So, And they had an eager, very smart team, although they weren't super experienced. So, so that was the assets that, that I saw, at least at the beginning. Now, the liabilities, of course, is, well, we have limited time. And as part of time, um, that made us realize we kind of have to do things incrementally. We need to show value quickly, meaning in weeks or at the bare minimum a month or something. We can't do a big bang approach and say, let's design a brand new, awesome, event source, buzzword compliant system that uh, will be ready in two years. It's, well, we have to get there incrementally. And, and that has its own challenges, of course. And with the regulations in the highly regulated industry, if any of you have worked with PII compliance or healthcare or you know, finance, you know that something as simple as putting a message on a queue that's got you know PII data in it causes just ripple effects downstream. So we know that there's there's a lot of security complexity that we have to keep in mind. The team's unfamiliar with DDD and cloud, so how do we how do we manage that? Right? How do we level up the team? Um, and and there's 427 work states in this system. And if anybody, how many people have worked on a mainframe before? Awesome. And, and some of you don't have gray hair, which is really cool. Um, but often mainframe systems are programs and CICS transactions move things from one state to the next, and it's really one COBOL program to the next. And um, in this particular case, for this one space that we're looking at, which happened to be customer onboarding uh, for a financial system, loan applications, credit cards, how do we, how do, we do that process? As part of that process for all the different products that they have, there were 427 different possible states that an application was in, and that meant 427 COBOL programs. And of course, we still had time to deal with. So, um, so part of the thought process was, okay, do we teach DDD? Do we, how, how do we do this? And, and we thought, well, at, at the beginning, really, the first thing we need to do is just figure out if we're even speaking the same language because um, as we've gone through this process in many different industries, uh, everybody has their own TLAs and some FLAs, you know, the, all the acronyms. Um, but also people, and we've seen this in the conversations in the hall here, have very different definitions of what is a domain, what is a context, why is it important? Is it really important to focus on defining what that is or is it important um, to solve the problem. And in some cases, maybe just finding the definition of something like modernization um, is less important than saying it's this definition. It's more important to just, just agree that for our particular team, we, we think that that definition is X. Um, and of course, event storming was, was my go-to process to, to start with that communication. How do we get that ubiquitous language? Right, and, and uh, um, this was a couple years ago, so it was still new enough that not many people uh, that I've worked with have tried this process, but we did. And so I, I led an event storming session, and in my head, part of what I'm really trying to get at is, um, how do I get enough information to move to the next step? But I know that it's not theoretical. It's I need to do this to understand the domain and more of a, an idea to come up to speed quickly. Um, I, I coined a term called 
constructive laziness because as an engineer, my first you know, initial thought was, let me look at the code. I want to see how things are working. And then it was like, we don't really have time because there's millions of lines of code, and that would just help me understand how the bad system, the one they want to modernize, the legacy system, was built and grew over time. It started out being great, but it, it grew, and I don't want to spend the time understanding that. So let's, let's go through and see what presents itself in event storming. Um, as part of that process, too, though, uh, knowing that the, the, the client really wasn't familiar with this either, I knew that, uh, you know, the people side of things, this would be good, a good way to get people out of their space, thinking more big picture, you know, a little bit more visionary. And so we went through that process, did the event storming, and for me, I could see, hey, there's clumps. Um, these clumps of stickies are really kind of organized around something that I'm not going to spend time nitpicking on whether it's an aggregate or not, but to me it was, that's a potential service candidate. So I, I didn't stay very detailed on that. It was more of, okay, I'm starting to see how the system really looks, and it's actually much, much simpler than they thought. Um, and it's, it's that way because typically with monoliths, you're plugging more stuff in and, you know, and it gets really big and hairy. So, so that was great, and then I was like, okay, everybody's really happy. The event storming worked well. We have the business and the technical folks speaking the same language now. Um, okay, now what? We need to start writing code. What do we do? And then it was like, okay, well, we need to, we need to start modeling, right? You know, how, do, how do we model this, this system? And, uh, you know, because the communication was still hard, I could say, oh, this domain, you know, this capability is going to talk here. We could even do context mapping, but it wasn't quite, it wasn't quite doing the, the work. And so the way I was thinking about it is really we don't want to tell you how to build your system. I want the system to, you know, to identify how it wants to behave. And that was kind of the flip of the mindset to, to say, let's, let's figure out how the system wants to behave, um, not necessarily me telling you how to do something or vice versa. And so as we were going through this approach, started thinking about, well, what really is modeling in this case? It's really systems thinking and relationships. I really want to know how a particular capability relates to another capability. Um, and, and I need that kind of North Star direction to, to help define that. And as we were thinking about these relationships, there were some other kind of epiphanies that came to the front, one of which is we can build things much quicker if the, the component or the service, um, you know, bad word microservice that we need to define, but if a service doesn't have to know very much about its downstream processing, that makes it so much easier to build this service. It's really that constructive lazy approach. I could throw something over the wall and we can do um, you know, testing around the contracts that we have defined. So, so that was something that we started thinking about as a, guided, a guiding principle. Um, and we have constraints that we need to apply to this too. We can't do necessarily the right thing all the time. We have to do the good enough thing because we actually need to get software out the door. Um, hopefully we don't make big mistakes, but good enough was kind of a theme here. And so, how did we go through that process once we realized we need to do that? Um, we started thinking about how do we discover these relationships? And of course, at this point in time, you know, a week's gone by and I'm getting nervous, but I realized that there's non-technical relationships that already exist because we're modernizing an existing system in this case. And so the functionality is there. So our goal isn't necessarily to add new business functionality. Our goal is to simply go through the process of figuring out what capabilities exist today because we want to make it at least as good, but we're not necessarily focusing on making it better other than architecturally. And then also we think about humans and mapping, modeling um, and mapping. Humans are really good at visual uh, processing, right? So when we look at something like the murder board behind Hank here, um, there's a reason why people start doing that and they start thinking about how, how the relationships go. And it doesn't have to be technical necessarily, it's just simply, you know what, this thing cares about that thing. Um, that's interesting, right? 
And so what we did was we started playing CSI DDD. So we, we wanted to do some detective work and figure out how the system wants to behave. And again, this is important because when everybody's thinking about how it wants to behave, you, from a soft skill standpoint, you kind of minimize calling people's baby ugly, right? Because that's a big thing. I spent 20 years building this system and you're coming in and telling me it's ugly. Um, this way we're saying, no, nah, it, was, it was awesome. It's just grown so much over time. Let's see how it wants to behave now and you can have another baby and you could like it even more. And that, that was kind of a side effect, but, but it worked. So, so the end result was interesting. Um, because I started looking around the room and, and was thinking, okay, how do, we, how do we do this? And I saw, I th saw on a desk three skeins, skeins of yarn. Apparently, COBOL developers like knitting at their desk. I don't know what the deal with that is, but there was a bunch of yarn there. And so I said, well, let's, let's just take a, take a shot. And, and we started going through the process of doing what eventually evolved into the Boris exercise. And I'll explain a lot more in just a few minutes on what the Boris exercise is. But when we did this, uh, in addition to people learning how to tie slip knots, which in the retro they actually really enjoyed, um, we started to get a model of a system architecture that was choreographed, not orchestrated, that was reactive to state changes. You know, as an example, application submitted, right? Somebody submitted an application, and we know what application meant because we went through our definition process, a new application meant application for a line of credit, not an application we deploy. Um, but it started driving out these guiding principles. And as I explain later in this talk, what really happens through this process, um, it, it actually generated a consensus, our guiding principles, and it let us exercise all the what ifs, right? Because you, know, you always have the negative people who are the really good testers that say, well, what happens if this? And, and you can still model that and just walk through. Um, and there were some happy unintended consequences with this too that I'll describe in a second. But basically, when you look at this picture, it's kind of easy to see that there's some red and green, which means those are two kind of different subsystems, um, different contexts, but they interact with each other. And you can also, at a glance, see where the important pieces are, where the important cues are, for example. Who cares about a particular state event um, more? And it made it really easy for the customer, for one, the business people were able to come up and show the executives, here's what happens in our system, and they're standing at the board and pointing to it. And it's like, well, that's kind of cool. They actually like this kind of format better than having something digital because it's more tactile. And this was almost three years ago. This company still has this board up in their office, which is really cool to me. Um, but it's evolved since. So some of the lessons learned from that are, okay, we got further down towards how do we get a backlog that we could start doing work on. There were some things missing, um, but it was good enough and the customer was very happy um, and we had been back since on several other programs to do the same thing with different, different teams. Um, <laughs> But the l big lessons learned were the problem discovery, right, and changing how people approach and define problems can definitely be achieved through arts and crafts, architecture through arts and crafts with DDD. And part of the power behind that I found is you get people thinking outside of the box, right? You have to turn, them on, turn their thinking on their head. They're so used to thinking the same way. I want to look at your COBOL code, or I want to run it through a code scanner to try to generate domains for me, and you know that gets really complicated. But if they think about what, what is the real problem we're trying to solve, this is a way to kind of flush that out. Um, the second way, uh, the second lessons that I learned is facilitating teams to discover the solutions uh, and let the solution present themselves is far more effective than my mother's approach. And my mother's approach is because I said so, right? Which I'm sure you guys have seen and heard. But that approach requires an awful lot of political capital and trust to have somebody come in and say, well, because I said so, you should do this. And, and uh, I think that's too easy to lose. So, so having it present itself, let the solution be the hero and not the architect. Um, which worked well. And also applying constraints led to docket-based choreography, which is a different talk, but that's something that this team was not ready to go from mainframe and MQ to something like event sourcing and CQRS, but there's some place in the middle 
that evolved out of this called docket-based choreography, which is really an event-based way of handling these state changes that's really lightweight and it made sense for that team. But also the teams, as I mentioned, owned the Boris diagram and they, they iterated frequently. So once it was up on the wall, it was small enough and compact enough to be able to iterate on and make changes to without having to go through another round of event storming first. So it helped us skip a couple steps. Um, and there was no single owner of the design, which was a huge unintended consequence because normally there's one person and they might be just the most vocal, but they end up owning the design. In this case, everybody contributed and owned it um, and the team came together a lot more. So in the end, that project was successful despite the fact that I had no idea what I was doing up front. Um, but because it was successful, we iterated and enhanced it over the years. And so now the SWIFT method includes the first step of event storming, which is defining that language, but it's, it's done with a bias towards finding the service candidates. And the service candidates, because, you know, People have different definitions of what a microservice is. You know, our goal when we're doing this is looking for cloud-native-ish, 12-factor compliant services because it works well in the cloud, it's easy to scale horizontally fast, and, and it's cheap. So once we get enough information in event storming to go to the next step, we see that now we can model those relationships between the capabilities or contacts or domains that, that were driven out. And then we can use thin slices to expose work that needs to be done, not not just the notional architecture, but the synchronous versus asynchronous um, interaction, um, and more importantly, how we do the data, because everybody forgets about data as part of modernization. You can model your data and move your domata, your domata, your data into domains and uh, follow the same process. And then Snappy is when we're capturing this information, as we're doing the Boris exercise, we're generating a lot of discussion, a lot of information. We have to capture that somewhere, and I'll, I'll give more information about what each of these is in a little bit. Um, but before I do that, Snappy is, didn't, Snap didn't used to be an acronym. And it meant we're doing something really fast and capturing it on stickies, you know, doing it in SNAP. And somebody said, we need to have an acronym. So I said, how about we just call it SNAP, not analysis paralysis. And that stuck. And so the E is now enhanced. So SNAPI is SNAP, not analysis paralysis enhanced, but it's really just a shorthand way of gathering data. Um, and then once we have that information, now at this point we can start thinking about what are the technical patterns we want to apply. So part of the benefit that you may see, or I don't know if it's a benefit if you're a product company, but we're not, we're not solutioning prematurely. We're not saying a product like Kafka will save the world or Cloud Foundry is the silver bullet that, that will make your, your applications hum. It's more of... Um, now we know how things want to behave. Now let's see what patterns we can apply to solve those problems based on the constraints that we have. And then the goal ultimately is we need to generate a backlog of work for people to actually start doing something with, right? So as we're going through these layers, the end result is generating a bunch of user stories in our backlog, whatever that backlog means to you, and then we start doing the work. And we get that rapid feedback loop, so it takes the risk off of, did we solve these problems correctly? And it's like, yeah, most of the time, but, but not this one, so that's fine. We can change fast, right? And then we just rinse and repeat that process. So, um, so that's kind of what we started doing, and over time, what we found is we can kind of focus very powerful tools like event storming to certain purposes, right, and use event storming um, multiple times, but maybe we do event storming and stop at the point where we've defined the ubiquitous language and the capability or the domains or contexts are starting to form. And once we have that, we know, well, that's our first service candidate, right, is something that is handling the applications or this is something that's handling the decisions part of the system. 
Um, this may be something that is with this complex system. There's, there's fraud services. There's OFAC, which is, you know, in the U.S., it's a, uh, it's a mandatory terrorist network kind of thing. When you're applying for credit, they want to make sure that you're, you're not, you know, a terrorist organization somewhere. Um, all of those things need to be integrated. Credit reports, v uh, identity verification, all of those start to, to fall out of here, and those candidates for services start presenting themselves. So once those clumps present themselves, then we go into the Boris exercise. And this is where, where things get interesting. And um, it's not just, hey, let's draw a diagram of something of how they are. It's really as we're going through the nodes, every blue sticky you see here is really the consolidation of the clump of stickies that we saw in the event storming, right? This is, this is our service candidate, our, our domain. So each one of these stickies represents those domains, and we're calling them nodes because really what we're doing is we're using graph theory to model your system. And People don't have to know that, right? It just happens. Graph theory is showing those relationships, and we could have different flavors of relationships. And at a glance, you can see you know, the busy services, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but you can, you can maybe help even prioritize some of your backlog based on the visual information. But people like to hear things like, hey, I use graph theory, so I've got directed nodes or you know, directed edges and, and uh, all of that. But, but in the end, really what it is is we're, we're going through the process of figuring out how the system behaves. But we're doing it from something called a thin slice. So a thin slice is how we facilitate that. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But you need to, if you start out with just a bunch of single blue stickies and you're trying to figure out what the relationships are, you need some sort of story to walk you through how you, how you model that, right? You know, how does somebody, what happens when somebody applies? Maybe it's a happy path. What happens when the, uh, our competitors use biometrics now for identity verification, just picture on your phone. And how do we add that? And we, okay, let's play the what if game. What happens if that happens? Oh, cool. The way we modeled this is we just add another, another component here that responds to that. I need more info. And, and it just happens. So you, you test that, but you need kind of that simple thin slice walkthrough, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and, the, again, as we're talking through this, now you can start to see that we can organize teams around each of these capabilities that we're building. And that's when you can start parallelizing, parallelizing your team scale, which is really cool, right? Because it doesn't have to be one small team. You can, you can have several teams working on the same basic uh, modernization program, but they're all working on different pieces. And because we've modeled how the system behaves, you have things like the, the contracts defined. I could do all my work, build all my testing, because I know I just have to throw a message over the wall that's small, like just an ID, and somebody else downstream that cares about it, they can call back in through my API to get the information. Awesome. That also means that I'm not persisting PII data, you know, somewhere where it shouldn't be. And more importantly, I'm not expecting that the downstream systems need to know this information, and I don't need to know who cares about something, right? It makes that development really simple because I'm just saying, this thing happened, the state changed. Um, if you care about it, do something. If you don't have enough information to do something, you know where the services live, call through the API and get the information. Um, and I know some people are saying, oh, there's latency, what do we, do? don't worry about that yet. It performs really well in the end, but we can test it. So phase two of the Boris exercise is once we know here's how the new system, our guiding principle, we've narrowed the aperture to the point of we've identified a lot of stuff we know we don't want to do, so we're going to walk the other direction. Once we have that idea, now how do we make that incremental? How do we jump in? And, and say, I want, to, uh, um, I, want to I want to do pieces, right? I want to be able to do uh, 
a thin slice of functionality, or I want to just build a fraud service first, but I need it to work with the existing system. And that's where you see the yellow stickies here are, okay, as we iterate through the Boris exercise, now we're talking about, okay, I this new piece of the system, the decisioning system, wants to own this data, but today I can only put a piece of functionality, like a happy path in there. So for everything else, I need to kick it back to the existing system. And that's where defining your ACLs comes in, those tactical patterns come in as well because it's, okay, I know that for the happy path, it could go through my new system and then I shunt it back to the old system. There's 50 different ways of doing that. We don't have to solve it until we get closer to that, that point. So, um, so that's the piece of seeing what your North Star principles are and then tying that to um, the existing systems gives you a roadmap, so to speak, um, and a ton of backlog to get there. So the thin slice itself is really just like a happy path, a, a story through the system of, you know, maybe here's, here's, here's the you know, applying for a credit card, all the things that happen. It's not user-oriented necessarily because most of our systems are automated, you know, a system talking to system. But as we go through it, we figure out that from an easy case, a happy path, we define a lot of those relationships. And then we um, have that complex thin slice that makes people feel better that even in the bad cases, we have a solution for it. We've got cross-cutting concerns and notifications and alerting. All of that can happen easily. Um, and we've documented all of that with the snappy. So as we're actually doing the stickers and putting the process up, we're capturing things like, here's the APIs. When I do a line from one point to the other, I've got APIs. Um, you know, because this needs to talk to that. Or I have things like this particular service is publishing a lot of state changes. You know, this happened, this is important, this happened. And somebody else may say, hey, I really care about when a loan application was saved because I want to start the process. I'm the credit reporting system. I'm going to, you know, start doing my job, for example. And if you need to change the order of how things process, you just simply listen to different topics, different cues. Um, but we document all of that, and we also document the data. Like from a domain perspective, the application management service really should be responsible for the data as well as the business functionality. So we start modeling that, and then as we get to um, all of that information of what needs to be built, we can start applying the tactical patterns to that. So for example, with the data, we know that this system wants to be responsible for this particular set of data. So let's build, um, maybe in that case, something like CQRS pattern makes sense to keep data in sync. Or maybe it's as simple as, you know, anything writing through my new system I store locally, and then I'll you synchronize with the existing system, or I want to use a data grid, or maybe I'm going full out event sourcing. Um, but also maybe I'm doing event shunting, you know, as I publish out a state change, I have an ACL that now proxies that request to the existing mainframe system, so it stays whole for the other 300 state changes that it's managing. And really what we're doing is we're, we're building a highway, right? We're, we're improving an overpass by routing traffic around the thing we're fixing for, until it's done. And then when it's done, that tech debt lives in that ACL and it just dries up and goes away because it simply turns off. And now all of the new functionality is going to the new system. So as we've done that discussion, we've talked through those tactical patterns, um, we're generating a backlog of user stories. And this is the work that people actually will say, hey, in the matter of matter of a week, we went from not knowing what the system is even supposed to do or what modernize means to a backlog of user stories that we could prioritize and actually start doing work on, which is really, really cool. And the rest of that process is just iterating through and testing your assumptions, getting that rapid feedback. But in the end, the customers often learn almost by mistake or by um, accident that, hey, you didn't have to learn and study DDD. It actually just kind of happened by going through this process. So now people are like, oh, DDD is awesome. I love this idea. Um, it's not theoretical anymore because it actually applies to my, my system and it's 90% accurate to what Eric wrote in his book. And 
that just kind of proves that, wow, this is really useful. And so the, the process continues through and, and uh, in just a short time, you actually get a lot of output. So that's how it's evolved. Um, we've gotten a lot of successful implementations in many different industries, several multinational financial service companies, um, national retailers, Department of Defense, healthcare, as you can imagine, is highly regulated, prescription management systems, um, even some steel manufacturing, ticket brokers. So the, we feel pretty comfortable that this process validates the whole idea of DDD, but it also validates that there is a way to get from point A to point B um, with minimal pain, uh, you just have to be creative and uh, use arts and crafts and stay away from your keyboards for the first week. So that is, that is it um, for me, but I wanted to point out we have a website called switbird.us that you can go to for more information. And also I have uh, a sign-up sheet here. If anybody wants to be contacted later, if this wasn't enough and you want more information, feel free to write your contact info in here. Um, and we have a few minutes for questions, I think, right? He's bringing the microphone up. Uh, where did the name Boris for the spider come from? I was hoping somebody would ask that. And this is, this is a secret, so other people are using the Boris exercise and they're saying, I know how to use Boris, but Boris came to be Boris because it's really kind of a spider diagram, right? So when you look at it, it looks like a spider web, and my first thought was, well, let's call it Charlotte, but Charlotte doesn't sound very cool and it's not Eastern European enough and everybody would understand that it's Charlotte's web. So he said, what about, you know, there's that old Who song, um, that uh, is really obnoxious and kind of scary, but it's called Boris the Spider. So that's where the origin was. And uh, if you want to be disturbed, listen to Boris the Spider. I'm pretty sure that there were drugs involved when they made that, so I'm not condoning that. It's just way, the way the name came to be. Any other questions? I know I went through a lot of that really fast, but I wanted to, to get through. Oh, yeah. Um, maybe this was kind of implicit in your talk, especially towards the end. Uh, I, I, I find when you're talking about like TLAs or FLAs, like when you're trying to introduce a concept, going in and saying, I'm going to do event storming and this is domain driven design, you know, sometimes it falls on deaf ears. Is part of your success in kind of not s explicitly saying you're doing event storming and not doing domain driven design, just kind of doing the thing, seeing the value, and then going, oh, by the way, that. That, that is this. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I know that sometimes you, you, there's a battle between how important it is to define um, you know, the words like aggregate in, in those sorts of things. And what, what I found is sometimes you could punt on that and, but still define it later, and the definition sticks more because now you have an example of what to go through. But also, it, it makes it more obvious that we're letting the system kind of design itself, and we're not getting hung up on, on the words. It's important at some point, but it's not necessarily important up front. Oh, another one back here. He's so excited that you're making him go back and forth. <laughs> um, I, I had heard mention of Swift uh, over the last couple of years, watching uh, videos to do with um, you know uh, refactoring legacy systems from pivotal engineers, mm -hmm. and I had searched and searched for what that was, a bit more information, especially Snappy. I couldn't really find it. it, it are you fairly recent? Uh, uh, the SwiftBird.us, has this been around for very long? Because I certainly couldn't find you on the internet. No, so that's the one thing that everybody has complained about. It's like, okay, I hear about this, where is it? So, so SwiftBird.us is just the last couple months that, that we've been spending time on that. Um, and we want to contribute more to that as well because it's hard to scale this kind of practice if there's no documentation on how to do it, right? So the Pivotal engineers know it pretty well um, and do it for a lot of customers in a lot, lot of regions around the world, but it's kind of enabling 
accidentally. And uh, so this website is an attempt to get that out there more. And feedback is definitely appreciated too. Thank you for the talk, it's very interesting. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit uh, on this uh, Boris diagram? Uh, I saw you have different colors, different signs. Right. What, what, what is important on that diagram and what means what? Good, good question, let me, let me see if I can go back to show a picture. In this case, like the blue stickies are basically the nodes or the services. So, um, so the blue in this, in this case is here's, here's where the business logic is and the microservice itself. The red is these are the, the message queues. Um, where the state changes are being published. Um, the, the yellow is the external systems that we're interfacing with. So you'll see some Boris diagrams have you know, a halo of yellow around it because there's a lot of interaction that we have to do to keep that system whole. Um, and the colors of the lines make a difference too. So in this particular case, the red lines mean this is an asynchronous messaging. You know, It's something publishing or something that's subscribing. And the arrows are the direction that that's traveling. And the black or blue um, is something synchronous, like it's a REST call. So what we're looking at here is a service is exposing an interface or an API through REST, but it's also required to publish out some of that information. So by looking at this and interpreting what the, uh, what the colors in those interactions, that's what generates that snappy document that shows I need to build these or expose these APIs and I need to publish these state change events. Does that help? <laughs> it's still going back and forth. <laughs> I was wondering if uh, the uh, when you do the thin slice, does it has any have, have anything to do with the event uh, storm that you did before, or you start from other kind of uh, use cases? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a good question. How do you decide what the thin slice is? And often it is driven out through the event storm. And the original attempts we did was we, we looked at through event storming, what is that big pain point? And we said, that's the thing we need to do. And it turned out that that was actually really hard because there was so much complexity. So usually now we start with the thin slices. The very first one is what is the happy path? What's the easiest thing that we could use to exercise things? And the second one is the complex or the, you know, the, the pain point, something that was generated through the event storming. Or frequently, a particular business person will know, hey, this is my, this is my Achilles heel. I hate this. Can we just model that first? And, and then we do. But the event storming certainly informs it. Anything else? Awesome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you paying attention.